you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This morning's lesson from John chapter 2 is an interesting lesson. It's the beginning of Jesus' public ministry in the Gospel of John. And it's different than the other three Gospels, right? In each one of the Gospels, Jesus has an act that starts his public ministry. In the Gospel of Mark, it's an exorcism. Jesus removes a demon. In the Gospel of Luke, it's a sermon that is rejected. In the Gospel of Matthew, his first public act is the Sermon on the Mount, where he gathers the people and preaches to them. And in John's Gospel, he makes the party better. <laughs> right? That's what he does. He turns water into wine. And it's not a miracle. Did you catch that? Verse 11, it is a, it's a sign. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But what is it about this story that we need to know about? What is it about this story that makes it something that John thought that we needed to hear it and, and John gave it to us so that it could impact our lives? What is it about this story? Well, there's so many things here that just don't make sense. Um, on the third day, the third day of what? There was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Who is she? What's her name? According to the Gospel of John, she doesn't have a name. The mother of Jesus was there. See, this is interesting because in the last chapter we just read, John chapter 1, Jesus comes to us, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing was created that wasn't created by Him. And He came and was made to be in flesh and dwelt among us. And this is God incarnate. Living with us and walking with us. And oh, by the way, he actually has a mother. We just want to make sure that you know this. Because she's here at this wedding. How many times does this woman show up in the Gospel of John? How important is the mother of Jesus to the Gospel of John? And you can't judge that by how many times she shows up. Anybody know how many times Mary shows up in the Gospel of John? He guesses. Once. Uh, one would be a good guess because we have her here. So we know it's at least once. Thomas? Twice. Twice. Thomas would be correct. She's only ever in the Gospel twice. She doesn't have a name either time. Both times Jesus refers to her as woman. Now how many of you when that was read, heard it read this way? Jesus and his disciples has also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is of that to me? Right? Is that how you heard it? It's exactly how we, we hear that, right? It's like Jesus says to her, woman? Really? What are you thinking? I, I honestly don't think that's the way it was. I think it was more of a, a woman, what concern is that to me? It's not derogatory at all by any stretch of the imagination. It's just the way that Jesus refers to his mother in the Gospel of John. Because the second time that, that Mary shows up, I'll call her Mary because we know her name is Mary, is where? Do you know Thomas? He had the right answer, too. At the cross. She shows up in John chapter 19 when Jesus is hanging on the cross and she's standing at his feet with the disciple that Jesus loves and he says to her, Woman, here is your son. And he turned to John and said, Here is your mother. She is there the beginning of his public ministry and at the end of his public ministry. Because she is the one through whom God brought himself to be in this place in the flesh. 
And he's not being derogatory towards her. But he is telling her that it's not his time to do this. So why does Jesus do something about this? Why did Jesus do this? All of the mothers out there are hoping that I'm going to say, so all the kids here, it's because his mother told him to, <laughs> and children are always supposed to listen to their parents, right? <laughs> that could be it. It might be. It's hard to say. But Jesus tells the servants to fill up six jars used for ritual cleansing which hold water. But how much water? 20 to 30 gallons each. And there are... Who's good at math? 180 gallons. Gallons of wine. And not just any old wine. It's the good wine. It's the best wine. <clears throat> this party had been going on for we don't know how many days. They said on the third day. My assumption is this on the third day that this feast had been going on now for... <clears throat> Three days, right? Because in this day and time, wedding feasts were not just like a reception where you went and you just hung out for like three or four hours, and then it was a it was an affair that you hung out at and you came to and you went home and you came back to and you were there for extended periods of time. And this is not just something that 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 they would have taken lightly that they ran out of wine. This is an honor and shame kind of thing that needed to be dealt with. But the question is, is why did Jesus' mother care, and why did Jesus care enough to do this? You see, it's in the words that Mary says to the servants. Mary came to Jesus and said, they ran out of wine. And Jesus says, I don't, that's not my concern. It's been a great party so far. We've had a really good time. But if they ran out of wine, maybe we should just be done. If you're right. <laughs> Can you ever have enough? Then Mary turns and walks away, and what does she say to the servants? Do whatever he says. Do whatever he says. And what happens next? He says, fill up the water jugs, they fill them up, and then he says, go draw a little bit of the water and take it to the wine steward. They take it, and the wine steward is like, where in the world did this come from? And he goes and asks the, the bridegroom, the the man who just got married. Where in the world did this wine come from? You know, normally people get the, the, the really good stuff out first, so when people are drunk, they don't know what they're drinking, so you can drink whatever, they, whatever we have. Right? But you save the best stuff for last. The wine steward doesn't know what's happening. The, the bridegroom, the person who's put together the wedding and is, is there to celebrate his wedding, has no clue what is happening. Things are backwards in this story because the people that shouldn't know what's going on, the lowly servants, the one who just filled up these water jugs, have every clue of what's happening. But the bridegroom, the people in charge, the people in the kitchen have no clue what's happening in, at all in this story. And Jesus has just turned this, this lowly feast that was going to become a shameful event into something that's going to be the talk of the town forever. Because the servants did what? They did what he told them to do. You see, when we listen to Jesus, and we do what he tells us to do, great things happen. Now notice, bless you, it didn't happen, bless you, for the servants. Right? The servants really didn't get anything from this. They did what Jesus told them to do. They're probably going to get a little bit of what in the world happened and how did all this and a little bit of praise for actually doing what Jesus told them to do later. But in, the, in that moment, they get nothing. The wine steward gets gratification from the bridegroom and the bridegroom gets sat satisfaction from the gathered group and their life becomes fruitful and becomes joyful because Jesus was there and was able to breathe life and to breathe his grace into that event where it could have become very shameful. But it became a much more joyous experience. And when we do what he says, that happens in the lives of others. 
Just imagine Jesus were here and we had 180 gallons of water here. Oh, the joy that would be. Right? Because of a wonderful event and the joy that spills out. It's not about water to wine. It's about God's love being thrown into or poured out over or infused into the lives of everybody who is there. It's about God being in the moment and understanding what needs to happen. It's about Jesus being in the moment and understanding what needs to happen and infusing and empowering people to go out and to give his love to everyone. You see, in, in the Gospel of John, as I said, we get back to verse 11 says, this was the first of the signs that he did. How many signs are there in the Gospel of John? Here's your clue. <laughs> There's seven. How many days of the week are there? Seven. What's actually that eighth sign in the Gospel of John? It happens after John chapter 19. We'll celebrate it on April Fool's Day this year. Jesus rose from the dead. It's the eighth day. The new creation. Each one of the seven miracles or signs in the Gospel of John is something that's not supposed to be a miracle for anybody else. Not that it doesn't give something to somebody else because it infuses God's love and grace and joy into the world. But each one of the seven signs in the Gospel of John is something that points to the fact that Jesus is who he says he is. It points to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, and he has come to give us life and to give us life abundantly. And if we will only listen to what he says and do what he tells us to do, that abundant life will be given through us. And by being given through us, it will also impact and come back to us. So look for the signs that show us how much God loves us and who Jesus is. And then do what Mary told the servants to do. Do whatever he tells you. Because that will give you an abundant life that will share his love with all of you.